the speaker is um, uh, a quite illustrious uh, historian of uh, music instruments, or would you describe yourself as that? It's a um, musicologist, music historian, or a music historian, yes, yeah. with an emphasis on um, on uh, the instruments themselves, and then the focus is Italian uh, music. So how do you get from Italy to China? Uh, through various routes, if you've studied Chinese history before, uh, but uh, in this case, it was uh, through music and the introduction of uh, music to the court, the uh, team court. Here we have a, um, a key figure who uh, uh, features in the work of Peter Orsop uh, uh, prominently, namely uh, Teorico Pedrini, uh, who uh, our speaker has uh, uh, study in uh, a number of ways, both in the um, the, the origins uh, of the, uh, the musical tradition itself, and then also the, the you could say the court political uh, context that arose out of it. So here we have a uh, a, a very interesting example of a uh, an interface between uh, political history and cultural history. So. Uh, and of course, religion. So yeah, this enters enters prominently. So we have a, a very um, uh, rich um, uh, topic in itself. Uh, um, it also is very familiar with the Chinese setting as well. Regular visitor, regular teaching regularly in China. And um, um, we, uh, I uh, would like to invite all of you to ask uh, very direct questions afterwards. Um, so don't be shy and uh, you don't be afraid. So we have, uh, we don't have a lot of that. Yes. Right. Uh, so thank you very much. This is, uh, the session itself is recorded and we'll um, uh, try to make it available on the, um, uh, on the SOAS China Institute's uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, and uh, uh, for the discussion part, we'll switch the recording off so you can speak as freely as you like. <laughs> um, at this point, I would like to hand the word to our speaker, uh, Professor Paulson. Let me go. Right, following on from that, I'll just tell you how I got to agree. I, I was running a conference at the University of Exeter, where I was for a number of years. Um, one of the American professors, did you know that they uh, performed Corelli's music just written before on Corelli uh, at the Imperial Court of China in the early 18th century by Bob and Felix McFly? Never heard of this. And she uh, worked in China for six years uh, and I can tell you. She asked if I would mind looking in the house of his order in Rome. He just spent the last 10 years working in Rome and uh, if there was anything left. So one day I went on to the house. Is a Lazarus mission. And sat down there, 400 pages of his letters. Really, most famous composer of the period. three pages of his letters. 400 pages so sitting there. And I went through them and and never forget the last one to his brother. This is the last step I'm going to write. I've not received a letter from you for five years now. I can barely see I have a good feed. But I will see you in paradise. And uh, by the time I got through that, realized that the fact that he took Western music to the Imperial Court of China is very interesting. It's nothing like this before as his contribution. 
mixing of the Chinese wines. And uh, quickly, I realized that if you mention China, people put you honey. And uh, <laughs> my entire life working on the Italian trees, and I says, no one gave me a penny. As I started talking about China, got two leaves of the oceans, 40,000 pounds. So that's a good trick. <laughs> anyway, let's get on to all the I first came across Theodorico Veggi in his capacity as a musician when I was researching for my biography in Bonhangelo Peretti. Peretti's music had found its way from Europe to the new world. So I was hitherto unaware that it also performed at the Imperial Court of China in the early 18th century. Petrini was undoubtedly responsible for this transmission, but he made no claim to be any more than an amateur musician. In a letter to his mother on 4th of July, 1730, he was quite dismissive of his employment. I've already written numerous times that the emperor has given me seven pupils to teach music to. Having heard this, he's delighted at their progress. So much so that at the end of my days, I shall see myself as my estimate of Peter. What a fine addition. Providence, it seems, had destined Pedrini for this work. The Spanish Emperor's interest in European music had already been nurtured by the Portuguese Jesuit Tomás Pereira, whose untimely death in 1708 had left his the Emperor was anxious to fill. On hearing of the arrival of a new influx of missionaries in Macau, he made inquiries as to their competence. The freedom was summoned. To Beijing as a musician, along with his companions, uh, Matteo Ripa as an artist, and Guillaume Padre Pantoja as mathematician. He just introduced you to. There he is. Um, had several different. Uh, this uh, across a number of authorities, and they surprisingly disagree. But the most likely thing is that it, he's a, a, a Mandarin of the first order, if you can tell by the red thing that that's probably right. And it's the, that, that's probably right. When it was painted, we don't know. But, uh, um, I, I do know probably where it is, but I'm not allowed to say. Uh, I say, oh, it's The Beitang collection, now housed in the National Library of China, contains a remarkable set of 12 sonatas, violin and bass of the three, with the thinly described anagram of the treaty. The only manuscript of Western music from this period known to survive in China. Furthermore, and she commissioned him to write a treatise on Western music, Trubian, uh, which forms the fifth volume of the New Year's Week, True Company of Music, a brief outline of the European history. All this is of considerable interest to musicologists, but pales into insignificance besides his chronicling of the latter stages. Chinese rights controversy 
that consumed Catholic Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. My research has uncovered almost 2,000 pages of his correspondence, mainly from China to Rome, cast a whole new light on the events of these critical years. Extensively a polemic uh, concerning the uh, compatibility of Christianity with the Chinese rites to Confucius and the ancestors. This became a bitter power struggle between the Jesuits and the papacy. <laughs> The so-called rule of Matteo Ricci, by which the rites were defined as, uh, defined as civil rather than religious, was fundamental to the Jesuits' modus operandi in China, one which they sought to defend at all costs. At this end, they drew up a manifesto of their own standpoint on the rites, which they then presented to the Kanxi Emperor on the 30th of November, 1700. Your servants from the bar do not know whether or not their stupid thoughts are justified. We respectfully request that the emperor favors us with his instructions and corrections. Uh, I've given you the list of all the references, just so that you can see uh, where the manuscripts are. There are really a huge amount of uh, manuscripts in uh, mainland Europe. Not all of them are there. There, uh, there are a lot in Paris. He was uh, spent several years in Paris. There are also quite a, a, a lot in Naples, because, as you will find out, his colleagues in Beijing uh, went back to Naples and they get yeah, right. There's a lot there. But mainly, there is propaganda meetings, huge numbers. Thousand, thousand pages of that uh, so, and what is this document? This document was sent to Clement XI as the epistola as someone him. When in future years it comes to be cited at the authorized imperial declaration on the rights. It is as well to remember that these are not the emperor's words, but those of the Peking Jesuits, which he was really asked to endorse. This response makes no mention of the rights, which expresses sentiments which would surely have been shared by the Pope himself. Revere heaven, serve ruler and parents, to be respectful towards teachers and elders, this is the code of all people of the empire. So this is correct. There is no part that requires emendation. As a newly ordained priest of the Congregation of the Mission, Petrini left Rome in 1702 to meet up with the first paid delegation to China under Charles Mayotte and Tonon. Primary purpose of this delegation was to assert papal authority over the mission and demand submission to the jurisdiction of the bishops and the vicars of apostolic, the authority of whom was disputed by the Portuguese. The objective never was to enforce the condemnation of the Chinese rites, nor could it have been since no decision had been made at the time of the negation's departure. Only when the Tornon heard from the Bishop of Peking, Bernardino della Chiesa, that the Portuguese Jesuit, Thomas Pereira, had pretensions to propose himself to Kangxi the superior over all the missionaries, that he took the fatal decision of requesting an audience with the Emperor. <clears throat> Only then did the legation take on the perspective in which it is widely held today of an admission to the imperial court rather than to the missionaries. Such subsequent meetings with the emperor resulting into fraud on banishment to Macau and the disgrace of Charles Megley, Bishop of Conon, are well known to the accounts handed down to us by the hardly objective the Jesuit commentators. Hence he also commissioned two Jesuit fathers 
Antonio de Barras and Antoine de Beauvoir as his ambas ambassadors to the Holy See. Later, he recruited two further graduates, Giuseppe Fabana and Jose Aramundo at the Axis. Fortuitously, um, since Barras and Beauvoir were both drowned off the coast of Portugal in January 1708. Finally, on the 7th of December, 1709, he authorized the issuing of the resident permit of Piao I don't know about you, but my man's shoes are certainly not very good. And I, I, I was expecting to find a lot of these. Yeah, not by many. I found about three of them. That's all. I think they've all been lost. But on the three that I've seen, they don't mention my Torah at all. That's the whole point of it. I suppose to enforce the rule of my Torah. They did. <laughs> I don't think they were ever intended to do that. It was only at this point in the saga that Pedrini made his entrance. Through no fault of his own, he had missed the boat that buried the rest of the location to China. It was actually actually waiting in San Marco for to his father. Spain didn't know where to go. Um, it wasn't the best time to uh, take a trip to China on account of the war going on, the Anglo-Dutch war. So, you know, it's not, not many birds going to China, but it's only about one a year. So, so the fact that he missed it, that he hadn't been told where he was supposed to meet it, wasn't his fault at all. The place of departure from the Spanish territory of the Canaries, rather than Lisbon as required by protocol, was kept secret so as to avoid an open challenge with the King of Portugal, Portugal's Patorado. In a letter from the Canaries dated 28th April 1703, Toulon expressed his disappointment that Pedrini was not to be amongst the company. I wrote to him in Spain to encourage him to take one of the two ships, but without telling him that he had to meet me in the Canaries, so as not to break the silence Monsignor Anuncio of Paris had imposed on me. Signor Pedrini took every step to obtain his embarkation with the gentlemen of the India Company, but they made excuses such as the smallness of the boat and the large number of passengers. He had already agreed to carry. He thus remained in Paris. When God grants him grace to set out on his mission, he will be able to apply the words of the gospel. First will be last. Had he managed to meet at this rendezvous, he would undoubtedly have shown the ignominious state of the rest of the nation, as Petrini was fully aware. God has not judged me harshly enough, and in effect, through his love, I have suffered nothing at all. And for this reason, I have been kept so long in travel, as he wants me to see this tragedy from afar, making me stand at the door without letting me enter. His divine will be done. He arrived in Beijing on the 3rd of March, 1711. By which time the papal constitution, ex to me, the DA 704, had pr pronounced the rites as superstitious and therefore incompatible with Christian teaching. This task was not an en enviable one. On behalf of propaganda of e day, he was to uphold the papal rulings against the staunch opposition to the peeping Jesuits while living in the house of the French fathers. Despite Gehrman's statements to the contrary, from, uh, from then until the present day, 
he had no independent view of the rights. As a true and faithful Catholic, the matter was a closed book to him. He laid out his position in no uncertain terms in a letter of 25th October 1726 to his repatri repatriated colleague, Matteo Rivo, in refutation of accusations of Jansenism. Until now, through the grace of God, I have remained in the same mission and indissolubly attached to my Holy Mother, the Roman Catholic Church, and all the doctrines and opinions approved by her. I hate and detest everything she condemns or reproves, and in particular Jansenism, with all its follows. And I give liberty and power to whoever sees this letter to endorse in my name as many formularies as the Holy See wishes this true, faithful, and sincere Catholic Christians to endorse. The obedience, veneration, love, and respect of which I am ready to spill my very lifeblood and a thousand lives if I had them, and in consequence of which I hate and abhor every other kind of heresy or schism whatsoever, and in particular that which the Jesuits have done in this mission to China, and the resistance that they have had and still have in receiving a constitution, Epsilon Die, and their accursed involvement with the Chinese superstitions of which they still depend. Thus I hate and I abhor Jansenism and Confucianism and as many types of heresy and schism as are found in this world, and attaching myself strongly to the Holy See, my most beloved and esteemed mother, and my natural prince, according to his holy teachings, I commit my spirit with God the Creator. I don't think you'd argue with him. <laughs> it was his bounden duty to inform Rome the extraordinary lengths to which the Peking Jesuit went in resisting the ruling, a duty which he fulfilled to the utmost of his ability. From the start, Petrini enjoyed its closest relationship with Taishi. No one was better received by the emperor than I, who was the lowest of all. So much so that from then on, he began to praise me, and so continued for many years, along with many gifts, continually calling me into his presence and constantly showing me many kindnesses, even distinguishing me from the other Europeans, with so much familiarity that he himself wrote the musical notes and made me correct. Giving me his own pen, he made me write at his little table. The both of us played together on the same chamber note, each with one hand. He did not himself raise the question of the rights. But matters came to a head in 1714, while the Emperor's summer retreat to Hall. This, this was his colleague, uh, Matteo Ripa. Uh, all these, quite a number of them, about 30 of them, they're all in the British Museum. That's funny. Well, well, they're rather good. In response to direct questioning, he outlined to him the contents of the papal legislation. To his surprise, the emperor reaction was not the outburst of righteous indignation predicted by the Jesuits but a calm and thoughtful appraisal, as if of a matter of little concern. And she then took the unexpected step of commissioning his master, uh, music master, to write to the Pope in his behalf. This he did on the 20th of October in a letter which has remained hidden in Archivioso Greater Vaticano until the present day. It was not until then 
that he presented the text and the already dispatched letter to the emperor. Much to Petrini's consternation, demanded that it should be translated into Chinese, not by Petrini alone, but also by the head of the Portuguese Jesuits. Um, unfortunately, Stump brings all manner of objections to the content. In the process of translation, the original text of the letter was largely abandoned in favor of one which accorded far more closely to the generous of the rights. It was in this form that the letter became known in Europe. Neither Kanchi nor Stum were aware of her previous earlier far more forthright letter. Perhaps it was this rewriting at the hands of the Jesuits that prompted Petrina's decision to send a memorial to the emperor dated 13th November, 1715, dealing with the precise contents of the legislation. This was destined to become one of the most widely circulated documents of the controversy. In fact, in his explanation, while scathing of the Jesuits who usually to set the papal constitution, is considerably more liberal than that of the Bishop of Cumberland. Once the doctrine, uh, document fell into Jesuit hands, little short of a death warrant, he bitterly resented between his evident reform of country. But worst of all, he had broken the conspiracy of silence about the Pope's decisions on the right. With the help of their court mandarin in Galatine, they set out to undermine uh, Petrini's credibility, just as they had done uh, that of De Tournant. Because I told His Majesty these things, the anger of the Jesuits is aroused against me. On every occasion, they persecute me, oppress me, hate me in a way that makes it very difficult for me to remain in their house. Their sole desire is that His Majesty expels me from China, does not permit me or anyone else to set themselves to remain here. Enemies of the sacred congregation of Propaganda Fide and their protector, Zhao Chang, lose no opportunity to harm its missionaries. In the following year, in 1716, the emperor himself prepared in his own hand the text of the famous Red Manifesto of Silence. Three hundred copies of which were to be sent to Europe. It was to be translated from the Manchu into Chinese and Latin, and then signed by all the missionaries. Nowhere in the text is there any reference to the rights of the person or to the papal constitution. But instead, Kanshi's main preoccupation is with the indignity of having no response to his previous embassies. On the 3rd of November, the short text had been prepared. The Europeans all assembled to sign it. Petrini, alone refused to do so on the grounds that he had no idea why the envoys had not returned and that he had never had any communication with them. This refusal enraged the emperor who had now come to believe that Petrini had thoroughly deceived him in his correspondence with Rome. In the Jesuits' eyes, nothing short of a full retraction of everything that we had written would be sufficient to assuage the imperial force. A formal confessional oath was to try. Petrini was adamant as to its exact wording. If I wrote anything that did not conform to the emperor's thoughts, I wrote a statement. In this <coughs> oath reached Europe, those who were mighty to do so saw in it a retraction of this tenacious staff over the years. Yeah. 
Graduates now sought to drive home their advantage, discredit him still further in the eyes of Kang Shi, raising accusations which she summarized in a letter to Propaganda PJ, written in numerical code on the 1st September 1776. Thankful that someone else did the coding, so I couldn't do it. There are lots of them. Um, there's actually one that they haven't done, which is very long. I can't do it. I'm not good at it. Accusations against Pedrini given to the Emperor of China by the Church Lords. One, Signor Pedrini gave false information to His Majesty by saying that our Pope had already deliberated on the Chinese rights controversy. Two, that he said this for no other reason than to persuade His Majesty to agree, so as then to advise our Pope to condemn them. Three, that he falsified His Majesty's words and wrote to our Pope to say that he could definitely condemn them because His Majesty did not object at all. Four, that our Pope, who wished to adhere to the Emperor's orders in all things, on receiving this advice, had condemned them and issued the apostolic order. All these were blatant lies, since the Jesuits were fully aware that the rights had been condemned before ever Petrini set foot in China. They never nevertheless had the desired effect of destroying the Emperor's faith, his erstwhile favorite. 1616, the mission was in dire crisis. Despite the efforts of the Bishop of Peking's vicar, Carlo Orazzi and Castorano, to promulgate the constitution to the Beijing Jesuits, their only response was to defend the administration of the sacraments. In effect, the mission has ceased to function in Beijing. Under such intense pressure, for the next two years, Petrini's health declined, and his letters to Europe in code came sporadically. Reaper, Matteo Reaper, reported Since the end of last year, 1717, Signor Petrini felt ill, suffering from violent pains in the head to continue for her vomiting. This illness became worse day by day. It reached the point. When the following year, 1718, began, I feared we would lose him. Saying that there was a chance that he was poisoned. I have shown uh, his symptoms. Um, that might well have been poisoned, and it wouldn't be the first time Jesuits have poisoned me. First back to health in the house of a Gentile Mandarin, according to Reaper, quotes scandalous comments from the Jesuits. This devil of a priest who pretends to be ill has gone to the Chinese New Year celebrations at the Gentile's house to visit the women. Towards the end of 1790, news was received of the convening of a second legation to China under Carlo Ambrosio of Matsubaba. Chances of a successful outcome of which filled the treaty with great disappointments. Jesuits were uh, used to meddling papal officials, and so prepared their strategies well in advance. They mounted a slanderous campaign, campaign against Petrini, maintaining that he had not been sent by the Pope at all, but was a spy. By the arrival of Matsubaba in 1720, he was in fear of his life. Destitute of all human support, 
I am often obliged for my consolation to remember these words, Dominus illuminatio meo e salus meo, quem timebo, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom then shall I fear? When the culpable fall upon me to devour my flesh, when the same come to raise the army of the whole society of Jesus against me, I shall always hope and will never leave off from the fight of the fight of the Lord, the sacred law, which the Holy See has prescribed to this minute. I am threatened with losing my life at the hands of the executioners. From Pedrini's account, the treatment of the legate was no less extreme. Mandarin Zhao Chang and his companions did not cease to harass him with terrible orders from the emperor, menaces, injuries, contempt, insults, everything was set into action to lessen his resolution. They kept him in a makeshift prison, putting soldiers in front of the gates of his lodgings prevent him from all communication with persons who would have been able to help him. The Jesuit Father Moral, Master Zhao Zhang and his companions, gave this minister of the Holy See such so much torment that during the entire day and part of the night, he was prevented from drinking, eating and sleeping. The greatest attention was to prevent him from saying a word to Signor Pedrini or from learning anything since. The official proceedings of the legation were to be taken from the so called Mandarin's diary, allegedly compiled by some court officials, but Pedrini was convinced that it had been concocted by the Jesuits and passed over to the Mandarin. He accordingly refused to endorse it on the grounds that Richard answers to the legate, which he never made, about subjects on which he never pronounced, and with many words which he had never spoken, at least on the times and occasions they had been attributed to him. How could I attest, said Sidney, that I had heard what I did not hear? And such was the reply of the legate, which he had given when I was absent. Father Moral then gave Zhao Chang the charge of telling the emperor that Signor Petrini had refused to sign the Jesuit statement. Once more, the emperor was enraged. But then another case was obviously, this time decided to take to make an example of him. In order that he should be punished under the supervision of Chao Chan. Deprived by the Jesuits' money, the Mandarins lost no opportunity to provoke the monarch who became enraged in order that Signor Petrini should be laden with nine large chains. While waiting with his hands joined behind his back, he received blows without numbers on his head, back, and stomach slaps on his face and kicks on all other parts of his body. After he had been spread out on the ground, he also received the fasting aid in the Chinese fashion. Afterwards, he was dragged like a dead beast out of the room. But a little while later, when he had come round, he found some new men, one the example of the first, caused him to feel the strength of their arms and their feet by blows without ceasing, which they discharged on him, losing him in a pitiful manner. After 10 days, Emperor relented and in a mistaken act of clemency, released him from the public prisons into the hands of his sworn enemies. My misfortune was that the Emperor calmed down in order to lighten my imprisonment, had me transferred from the public prison to the house of the Jesuits. That was not without machination on their part, because they knew full well that among the pagans I would not be watched with so much severity or oppression if I were in their hands. 
Thus Petrini found himself under brutal jailers, would stop at nothing to prevent him from communicating with Rome. They incarcerated him with extreme severity and violence. I was confined to a little courtyard on the south side where the kitchen was found and attached to it speaking. Politely, the public conveniences, that with the excessive heat of Peking, a stench was continually given off, capable of making a man die who was locked up there, if God did not have compassion on the unfortunate. They then erected a wall without a door and with a single window, locked by a key from the outside. One of their servants had orders to open it only twice a day to bring food, just as one does a caged lion. The emperor, of course, had no knowledge of any of this. The Venus salvation came on the death of Kanshi and the succession of his fourth son, Don Kyung, and since it was the custom to grant a universal amnesty to prisoners at his session. Now, by the grace of God, I find myself at liberty, in a position to be able to serve the Holy See, according to my feeble force, during the little life I have left. I am freed by this new emperor against the expectation of all, especially those of the Jesuits who certainly believed that they had made it possible for me to die at their hands. The new emperor exonerated Petrini from all blame. He resumed courtly duties for a further 23 years. Death in 1714. Immediately after his release from prison, he decided to invest in substantial property in the Sijim district. Thence had become the Peking residence of the propaganda of missionaries, where he would build a church, a large part from the revenues earned through the teaching of music and the sale of musical. This is the third church on the site. It is utterly beautiful. It really is. Uh, that, that's my friend's wedding, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> that's the 20th century that it was filmed. Last time it was knocked down with going boxes. The status of this building as a house gave it immunity from the sanctions imposed on the other three churches by the 1724 edict prescribing the preaching of Christianity. Chinese Christians flocked there in their thousands. Petrini informs Reaper that he was able to say two masses a day, especially the should be remembered had imposed their own restrictions by ceasing to administer the sacraments in 1716. The situation of keeping with the expertise of the <clears throat> missionaries is still by you hiding. It's actually very different from the severity with which Christians were treated in the provinces. Despite the various edict in the Board of Rights, as Petrini reports it on the 23rd of October 1741, the affairs of religion owed peace to be here at Beijing. In the provinces, there is trouble from time to time, but not of any consequence. Here in the capital, the sovereign leaves us in peace, although there is little contact with Europeans. It's still strongly felt in some quarters that it was Petrini's uncompromising stance on the Chinese rights 
is largely responsible for the eventual suppression of the first Christian mission to China, for which he was personally answerable. He belonged to those few missionaries who fully obeyed the decrees of the Holy See and preferred the ruin of the Chinese mission rather than the permit of the superstitious rites. In reality, the Chinese rites only became an issue in so far as the Jesuits wished to make it so. Had they not decided to enlist the emperor in their dispute with the famous, probably had remained in ignorance of it. Through Kanshi's audience with the Bishop of Cologne in 1705, that the emperor first became aware of the alarming extent of European infiltration in the provinces. The purpose initially yeah, was to control immigration rather than the attempt to enforce the role of Anthony Madame. As observant, not among Kaishi's uh, uh, priorities, as can be seen from his eagerness to retain services of the propaganda missionaries at court, none of whom were required to petition for the Piaf. The year of unrest remained constant. In the spring of 1770, Brigadier General Van Guangdong, province of uh, Chan Mao, delivered a memorial to the imperial authorities in the in the strongest term that the Europeans uh, constituted a great threat to the security of the King State along its southern coastal region. I know that the nature of Europeans is barbaric, and they use the banner of religion to control Japan. And I also know that after they seized the Philippines, in Guangzhou and other places, they constructed many churches and have won over the minds of countless persons. Therefore, we may consider the Europeans the most vicious and the most difficult to handle. Since there were then over 10 men of war, each with a hundred cannon in Macau Harbor, intending to continue to Canton, his suspicions were seen to be justified. The Chinese rights issue was a dispute among European Catholics. Pedrini always maintained that had the Jesuits were quick to condemn other equally great thus for such as Compi Binard and um, Ligamy had been willing to accept the decisions of the Holy City. This would have been tolerated by the Emperor as a matter of little concern. The Pope's prohibition was no impediment to the flourishing of Pedrini's church. Now become a proverb among the Christians. He goes to Pedrini's church or else to the congregation of the seven souls. Just as a, a way of saying that he observes the constitution. If he knew, always insisted that his actions had been, as he put it, AMTG, Adorum, A Glorium, rather than AMTG, Almorium, A Jesuit. <laughs> So what you heard here is actually uh, a crime story. It's like a novel. <laughs> it's, it's better than a novel because it's actually true. <laughs> and um, I, I've studied this uh, episode a few times from different angles. Also tried to study it from the Jesuit angle, <laughs> but it's the um, but but the severity of the uh, the treatment and also the of the language is extraordinary. It's uh, it is. Um, a, an intra-European affair with uh, international diplomatic consequences. Uh, so th this is a, two, a, a parallel case would have been in the 20th century, a discord between the different types of uh, communist uh, uh, believers from, uh, from different uh, directions, but belonging to the same organization, the same party, more or less. This is within the, the Roman Catholic Church, 
uh, and this is within a, uh, a setup which was actually authorized by by, by the Holy See um, initially. Uh, but communication at that point is, of course, a uh, a vital issue because if you've worked in an archive, for example, in the Propaganda Fide, you can see the dates and the dates between when a letter was sent and when it arrived. And the, the difference is sometimes enormous. So if in a situation like this, everything relies on the local situation and the local interpretation at the time. And that it is very difficult to, uh, to, to rely on guidance from Rome at this point. I, I was fascinated by, by your talk. I was uh, very much dating back to times when I had time to, to research. <laughs> uh, um, I would like to invite all of you to ask anything also about the, the wonderful documents that we saw. Yeah? Do you know what order the uh, journey belongs to? Yes, the congregation of Bishop here is a Lazarist. Uh, so French, French order. Yeah, well, that's the whole point. Clement XI really wanted Lazarus to join the English uh, group. Is there some particular animosity between that order and the Jesuits? There was animosity between the Jesuits and every old order. Because they were the time. Yeah, I think we're here. Are you a Jesuit? I'm educated. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I would. I have to say that when I was in my teens, I gave you a series of conversations. So this is going down. <laughs> but I'm afraid it's not. It's not to do with that what they were doing. Downright criminal. Whether nation got hold of that start. Money and all they are. They were doing they were there to make lots of money, right? And then after their suppression, of course, uh, many Jesuits became Lazarus officially. Mm -hmm. so, so it's the the, took over, really. the CM becomes essentially a, a it becomes the you know the Jesuits in waiting because of course they would be later readmitted. Go back. And you go back with them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you for the talk. That was really interesting, fascinating, actually. Um, I have two questions. The first one I know you said that the musical side of the story wasn't as interesting as the, the right controversy, but I was wondering what role maybe music played in, in this. I mean, you kind of suggested that the intimacy between Kongsi and Hadrini was formed through music. I'm not sure if in any of the other material you looked at, there's stuff on Kongsi's reception of this music, how he interpreted it, and how that maybe played a role. Um, and then the second one was just about the aftermath of this and whether or not the behavior of the Jesuits had any impact on the way that the court saw Catholicism in China. Right. So the first thing is that uh, I, I wrote a number of articles on uh, a dream used as my data in 2000, 2000. I've, I've done that. Not, not of this Italian, but the thing is that it is fascinating. Um, what fascinated me is that Kenshi should know so much about Western music. And his first meeting with Adrian, his first meeting, he asked him to eat. I always say to musicians, if you, you know, if 
something turns up somewhere. So what do you think of John Burroughs' 12 third system? That's that's full of questions he was asking. Maybe the truth is that this must be to do with what we need to do with uh, Thomas Perrault. Um, now, I've, I've, I've tried, if anyone's interested, yes, uh, one of my students to work on Perrault, and he didn't. He's a PhD. He never did this one. And then Massive the amount of manuscript to uh, Pereira in the whole in treatise on Western music, which he was writing in the end of the school. If he took over, his foreign was not to it. So that's probably, I'm going to say, you know, you have got all night, haven't you? I think what's most interesting is that. Uh, he asks him whether he uses C. You know, C directly, you know, C. Yeah. Well, they only use C in France. He said in history. Really unfortunate in the 19th century, that sort of thing. So, so she could only have known it. Yeah. So the would you say music played a, a large role in the sort of actual people to people engagements between the Chinese? I mean, all of this, these rehearsals and whatnot, but would this be a, it was a personal thing between the three and seven musicians as well? Or? Um, yeah. um, it was a number of the sons, also a number of five. Interesting, but it's, there's no, it's no more right than the doctors also as well. Do we really know much about Western music? No, all we know is what it really tells us. So, and they used to do concerts. Uh, more questions. Yes. <laughs> one, two. Probably the final student one. But I ask why the country does not trade petunias and like a political counterpose for like you know for um for Dutch about Dutch Greek and like a protest event, which is like a different role by and why can't you don't think like Virginia could like uh, against confu uh, confusionism could against like the balance and the, you know the balance between high and lectures like I can say the truth is that she wasn't at all interested in what they had. When does he say they say? He's not interested. Uh, so don't forget everything we found. It's not. And she any time to do 
There's never any mention between the joint. Other missionaries were interested in Confucianism. Not Pedrini, he was a solid knight in the war Catholic. He was there to convert you all to the true religion. I, I didn't catch that. So he, he said you, you said that he was not interested in Confucianism. Pedrini. I don't think so. No, that was a Jesuit thing. That, that was the, yes, well, it was some Jesuit things. Ah, yeah, yeah. Spoke Chinese or did he speak Chinese? I'm quite interested in you saying that he found Manchu easier. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. And of course that was he was very interesting. He never used his characters. Uses Transliteration into Latin or into Manchu? Latin. Into Latin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not a question, but just uh, the, there was a French Jesuit cardinal about 12 years ago, uh, this evening at Pizan. Yeah, I suspect you would know a fair bit of this. Was that Mena or no? What, what is the name? Yeah, I have to try to remember who told me and then. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. Is that a long time to write this? Um, I don't know. My story is that they closed my music department for I think 30 years in 2007. I've been to Beijing in 2006. And 2007, they offered me a job, so to be. So I spent the next 13 years on the That's how I came about. Now, I've got a captive audience here. Yeah. I'll just tell you some things because I'm not being recorded yeah. now. <laughs> I've got. <laughs> um, Stop it. 